Today we're going to talk about crossovers, how to set your crossovers and what that means and why it's important to get them right. And I'm going to do my best to explain to all of the newer people uh, how that works and to not, you know, bore my more experienced people to death by explaining something they already know. And hopefully I get everything right. So if any of you guys out there with lots of experience notice something that I get wrong, put it in the comments. We'll get her done. Let's get All right. So up here in the A pillars, I've got a tweeter. I've got a 3.3 inch mid range. And down here in the doors, I have a woofer and I have a mid driver, which thinks it's a woofer. <laughs> and I'm sending uh music to all these in fact up here i'm sending one signal with 150 watts on each side or 150 watts total 75 watts per side sending a signal to that i'm sending a signal to that and a signal to that and a signal to those doors over there so how do we define what does what and get that done I mean, we can't send subwoofer signals to the tweeters. We can't send tweeter. You don't want to send tweeter signals to the subwoofer. Uh, technically, you could. just wouldn't work. So there's got to be a way to sort that out. Now, <clears throat> uh, historically, there have been a lot of ways to divide. Um, years and years ago, we basically used chokes passive crossovers filters uh, in old car, old home audio stuff would use a filter which was just consist of a coil or a choke to uh, limit highs and a capacitor to limit lows so we'd use capacitors on the tweeters and the high range speakers and we would use coils to stop the highs from going to the low range speakers and woofers and this uh, assembly would call we call it a crossover network uh, and that's in many different iterations over the years has been basically how that's been done uh, also your equipment that you're using can limit those signals as well and so depending on what you're doing exactly it's going to dictate how you do it and in this case in here I'm actually using multiple ways to set crossover and I'm going to explain that as well as how to get those settings right. That's a key part of this. So let's move on. So we'll start out with the woofer. When it has a frequency response listed in this picture, then we get the mid range, which also has its set frequency response range that it can operate in. And then we have the tweeter, which has its range that it can operate in. And just because it can play these frequencies doesn't mean it should. So in this diagram, I'm gonna show you that this is the settings that I would run as a starting point to uh, get a good frequency response curve across all these drivers. And in this image, I illustrate the, uh, the crossover of the woofer, the mid-range, and the tweeter. And this is a random graph, by the way, so the, the, the numbers aren't the same. However, you can see that the green line represents the woofer's roll-off, and then the blue line represents the mid-range as it comes in and then goes away. The red one represents the tweeter as it comes in and goes and, and goes to 20K. The point where these lines cross is called the crossover like, point. So what are you working on? Uh, just doing a little LC2i Pro here for a customer with a Challenger or Charger? No, Charger. Sure. And uh, yeah, customer has a basic LOC in there and can't get anything to the sub unless he turns it up to 38, which 38 is max volume. But true max volume on those cars are 24 because 24 starts to start with mid bass and sub bass. You may not be able to physically hear it, but it's got electronic distortion. And when he's reproducing it through the amplifier, he's freaking the amp out and possibly hurting the amp and the sub. So what we're gonna do is tune at 24. And with this, we can change that input voltage to the amp from, you know, about maybe quarter volt to about 
8, 9, 10 volts and actually get some true thump and protect the amp and sub. So that's what I'm working on. All right, so I come up here today because I'm, I'm doing a video about uh, crossover points. Crossover points. Yeah, crossovers and how they work and why you want them. I'll tell you what, let me grab some speaker wire and some power ground or remote for this okay. thing. I'll come right so back. First and talk off, uh, what are crossover points? Yeah, points, depending on which one you're using, will tell you a point of uh, whether I have high pass, low pass, or if I have both of them, it creates a band pass. Gotcha. gotcha. And if you get real fancy, you start getting into all pass, and that's a that's a whole other ball game. But the uh, reason why you want these points is because if I have a tweeter, tweeters are only meant to play from, you know, roughly at about 5,000 hertz and above to 20,000 hertz. Um, I don't want my tweeter playing 80 hertz. You play 80 hertz through a tweeter, you're gonna blow that thing up. So the crossover point, I'll set for a high pass filter roughly about 5,000 hertz at either you know 12, 18, 24, 48 dB, depending on what kind of slope you're looking for off that crossover point and what the speaker recommends from the distributor or manufacturer every speaker is different every speaker has their limits and if you look on the box i don't have a box here but certain speakers will tell you hey we have a minimum of 80 hertz at uh what do you call that 18 db octave like a slope or we have 100 hertz at 12 db or we have 120 hertz at 6 db and what i mean by that by 6 db difference is the next octave down the 6 db's quieter or it's 12 db quieter 18 24 and so on and so forth okay and now that's a crossover that is a crossover point now uh now we're going to talk about types crossover <sighs> types change it yeah okay so the passive or pass through it passes through a block that you physically insult into the car and sometimes you can change the db of it like tweeters you can have like minus one two or three db on that attenuation attenuation yep and they are set at a certain frequency at a crossover at this slope that's you can't change it now an active one would be more like a dsp or an amplifier correct and if i prefer to have active versus passive because passive tends to take power from your speaker so if i'm sending 100 watts to my speaker that takes 100 watts but i have a uh, passive crossover on there well i'm not truly giving 100 watts to that speaker because i'm giving it some to the crossover and stealing efficiency so the passive crossover actually results in heat because it has to disperse what's being filtered and well we know that things get dispersed into heat and so I, why would you want to use a passive crossover that may be even an active and a passive together? Well, you can use both. I want to use a super complex, intricate passive paired with a active. What I would do is a very basic, simplistic passive if I'm running it with active. Just in case the data, which it can, fails on that active crossover. And that just tells me, okay, even if this piece, let's say this is DSP, this piece fails, I know I still have a safety net underneath to make sure it doesn't blow. It may not sound perfect like I want it to, but at that point I'll be able to tell, oh, hey, my DSP is not working. Now, if I blow it, I know, hey, both of them failed and I gotta figure out why. <laughs> So another case where you could use a passive crossover and an active crossover together is like in my install where I have a mid-range and a tweeter running on one channel. That one channel is set up to passively pass 1000 hertz and up to that combination and then the capacitor that I have installed on the tweeter it lets uh, 4 or 5000 hertz and above Go to the toy. So if you want someone to get the very best car stereo install and equipment that they're going to find anywhere, where do they need to go? Well, that's not as biased question. I would say come to me because I have a lot of information. Everybody here does, as far as me, Charles, Carmel. We've been in this for years. I have unfortunately been the uh, the shortest amount of time, but the shortest amount of time with the most growth, I would say, and that's kind of tooting my own horn. But man. 
I love this stuff and I want to provide a excellent service no matter what I do. And that's my main goal. If I can't make it perfect, and I can't make it above and beyond anything and everything else. I don't want to do it. Awesome. And you guys have a YouTube channel too. It is Carmel Car Audio There'll at YouTube. There'll be a link in the description. And um, come check it out. I have some goofy videos on there. I like to keep things friendly and keep things to where it's entertaining and not just boring and saying monotonous, monotone. Today we're going to be talking about the amplifier. That's stupid. I don't like it. It's you got to have fun. If you don't have fun, then what's the point of doing anything and everything in your life? You got to have fun. All right. Well, I appreciate you, bud. Absolutely. Hey, you have a wonderful day. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and come check out our channel as well, because I'm sure you'd find something that speaks your interest. So thanks, Joe, for taking time out of your schedule and helping us out with a secondary uh, set of information. Uh, basically, with the crossover networks, uh, you can either run passive or active. And like Joe said, uh, running passive does eat up some power. So some of the power that you're sending out is getting turned into heat, which means you're not getting 100% of it to the speakers. Um, in some cases, that's not really an issue. When you're, when you're blocking bass from a tweeter, you're not really sacrificing much power. That capacitor really ain't going to suck up too much power. But... The end result is you need to be able to get the tuning that you need and have the crossover points that you need to protect your equipment and also to make it blend well together.